All right, looks like we're live. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Joseph Christensen, and I'm going to be moderating a discussion today. We are honored to have with us Sir James McMillan and Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione, and we are going to be discussing today music and its wider implications. Um, for, um, before we do anything else, Archbishop, would you be so kind as to lead us in prayer? Sure. Thank you, Joseph. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, as we come together today, we thank you for this opportunity to learn, to listen, and exchange, uh, guide our uh, deliberations today, open our minds and our ears to the word you wish to speak, open our hearts to receive that message and put it into action. Grant us the wisdom to know how to spread your love and heal the world through beauty, that we might be better conformed to the beauty of the image in which you originally created us. Give success to the work of our hands and all that we do that it may be for your glory. We thank you for sending us your son who came among us as one of us to make us all sons and daughters of his heavenly father. And in that spirit of adopted sonship, we pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. Um, just as a matter of introducing our, um, our speakers today, um, Archbishop Salvatore uh, Joseph Corleone was born in San Diego his roots run deep in San Diego. He attended Crawford High School, San Diego State University, the University of San Diego, and St. Francis Seminary in San Diego. He was ordained a priest of San Diego, July 9, 1982. He was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of San Diego on July 5, 2002. He earned his doctorate in canon law from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. In 1995, he was called to Rome and served seven years as assistant at the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Synod, um, the church's highest canonical court. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI appointed Bishop Salvatore Cordiglione as the fourth Bishop of Oakland. A few years later, on July 27, 2012, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him the Archbishop of San Francisco, where he serves today. And um, our guest today, Sir James Macmillan is the preeminent Scottish composer of his generation. He first attracted attention with the acclaimed BBC Proms premiere of the Confession of Isabel Gowdy. His percussion concerto, Veni, Veni, Emmanuel, has received over 500 performances worldwide by orchestras, including the London Symphony Orchestra, New York and Los Angeles Philharmonics and Cleveland Orchestra. Other major works include the cantata, Seven Last Words from the Cross, Quickening for Soloists, Children's Choir, Mixed Choir and Orchestra, the operas Inez de Castro and the Sacrifice, St. John Passion and St. Luke Passion. The Bishops' Conferences of England and Wales and of Scotland commissioned Sir James to write a new mass setting for choir and congregation to be sung at two of the three masses celebrated by Pope Benedict XVI during his apostolic and state visit to Great Britain in 2010. First sung at mass at Bella Houston Park, Glasgow on 16th of September. It was sung again at the mass and beatification of John Henry Newman at Cofton Park, Birmingham on 19th of September. He was also commissioned to write a setting of the text to us Petrus for the Pope's entry at mass at Westminster Cathedral on the 18th of September. He was featured composer at Edinburgh Festival, South Bank Center, BBC's Barbican Composer Weekend, and Grafenegg Festival. His interpreters include soloists Evan, Evelyn Glennie, Colin Curry, Jean Yves Thibaudet, and Vadim Repin. Conductors Leonard Slatkin, Sir Andrew Davis, Marin Alsop, and Donald Brennicles, and choreographer Christopher Wielden. His recordings can be heard, found on BMG 
RCA, Red Steel, CIS, Chandos, Naxos, Hyperion, Coro, Lin, and Challenge Classics. So it's our honor to have you day, today, Sir James, and um, you have the floor for, the, uh, for your um, talk. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thanks for those uh, introductory words. And thank you, Archbishop Cordiglione, once again, and all, all at the Archdiocese for inviting me to be involved in this programme. Uh, it's a great delight and an honour uh, to be involved with the Archdiocese of San Francisco. Um, I, I realise that the title of my uh, talk today uh, looks a bit strange, music and some wider implications, a Catholic composer's perspective. Uh, it, that, could, that could possibly cover anything and, and everything. And, and maybe it will, and, and maybe it should. Um, I'm very aware that music needs to speak to the world and not everyone in, that, in our world are music specialists, but many, many of those people love music. And to try to find a common ground, try to find context for understanding uh, is so important, uh, whether those understandings are theological or even political and social, um, those implications, those wider implications um, can be pursued. So to begin with then, perhaps by way of introduction, I would say of myself uh, that I am sometimes described appropriately enough for today's lecture as a religious composer. But I think that needs a little unpacking. Who or what is a religious composer today? Does a religious composer only write music for the liturgy? Or can a sense of the numinous be found in all music, as some argue, including secular forms and purely instrumental concert music? The questions prompt much speculation and I spend a lot of my ta time talking about these things. But I think that my presentation today is an attempt to go beyond these questions to other questions too. I spend a lot of time listening to what many different kinds of people have to say about what I do and what people like me do. I find a lot of it fascinating and of immense help and of immense stimulation and great encouragement. Who are these people? Well, some are musicologists and critics, of course, but some of them are theologians attempting to interrogate the world of the arts, the world of imagination, and specifically the world of music to see if light can be shone onto deeper religious considerations. Some of them are social scientists, political minds who see important points of interface between the world of culture and the way that society can grow, develop and gain from the insights of artists and musicians. Because music has always had a social role and sometimes that role can intersect with religious concerns. Sometimes music and the other arts can even intersect with questions of ethics and morality especially in our own day, as well as aesthetics. So there are lots of interesting questions here. <clears throat> but perhaps I could begin by answering an, another question I get asked a lot, and that is, what modern composers do I like listening to? I specifically cite moderns here because we are dealing with the modern world. Of course, I listen to music from bygone centuries and decades, and I love this music. Palestrina, J.S. Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Wagner, Bruckner, Shostakovich, Benjamin Britten, and so on. But what about the last few decades and even this very day? Well, speaking personally, I've been intrigued by many of the composers who lived behind what was the Iron Curtain. Almost all of them, after Shostakovich, in, in reaction to the state-enforced atheism of the Soviet systems, became very religious men and women. And it's reflected in their music. A lot of it is music of Christian defiance 
and witness in the face of religious persecution. The most famous names are, I think, Arvo Pert, who is still alive and in whose company I was a, a few years ago in his native Estonia. And the Pole, Henrik Goretzky, who was a great friend of Pope St. John Paul II. With these composers and many others, I recognize that the search for the sacred is alive and well in contemporary music, and I think very much so in my own work. I also have a keen interest in the living world and how the sacred and the secular commingle and interact in it, and how this impacts on composers and artists especially in our own time. This fascination allows me to reflect on and search for the role that people like me might have in societies like ours, and leads me to other questions which might be appropriate for our discussion today. For example, is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? And does the work of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? I was asked these two very specific questions on a recent lecture tour in Russia, and they have given me a great uh, deal of food for thought. My answer to both is yes and no, but my indecision is complex. I'd like to start, if I may, with a consideration of the symphony in the modern age. Very specific, I know, but it might provide us with a useful launch pad. I've so far written five symphonies and I'm asked why composers still want to write symphonies today. Haven't all the best ones been written already? Is the form and idea not redundant in the 21st century? Hasn't modernism and postmodernism moved the cutting edge agenda away from the tried and tested? Is it not just nostalgia and conservatism to fall back on an idea from the past? Every composer has considered the possibility of writing a symphony and the questions that will be asked of him or her. Some decide it is not for them, but a surprising number in recent years and in our own time have persevered with the concept. But in various 20th century symphonies, we can detect the foreboding of the times, the fear and destruction of war and political oppression. There are some works which in retrospect have been regarded as barometers of their era. The English composer El Edward Elgar's second symphony was written in 1911, a few years before the First World War, and some detect in it the melancholy tread of civilizational collapse. Mahler's Sixth Symphony was written a few years earlier and is known, and is known as his tragic symphony, full of loss, culminating in literal hammer blows of fate. The final movement is like a stream of consciousness, astonishingly vast and unusual, with no set sonata pattern or design, strange recapitulations or no recapitulation at all. Like Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, it is hallucinogenic and nightmarish, but it's only at the very end of that the music becomes truly despairing. Perhaps a prophetic harbinger of the conflagration of World War. For both these composers, the symphonist extraordinaire and guiding light was of course Ludwig van Beethoven. And perhaps the crucial and central point in Beethoven's legacy for subsequent generations and centuries is his moral vision, a prophetic lesson which was to grab the imagination of composers over a century later. These more recent works that I've been talking about by Elgar and Mahler and many others, like their Beethovenian models, give the impression of, of having to be written 
a compulsion even beyond the will of their creators. I'm reminded of this every time I conduct Vaughan Williams's Fourth Symphony, for example. He saw this piece as pure music, unlike his first three. It's also more severe and angular in its language, not immediately inviting like some of the other music that he is famed for. It's not conventionally beautiful and seems troubled. Written in 1935, more or less at the same time as Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, which was another work that looked towards or looked uh, or seemed to detect the coming uh, tragedy in Europe. It also seems to detect the, this coming storm uh, in Europe and all over the world. Later, the composer said of it, I'm not at all sure if I like it myself now. All I know is that it's what I wanted to do at the time. Beethoven's symphonies have come to be seen as the pinnacle of artistic achievement in music. The distinguished art historian Alessandra Comini described Beethoven's music as having revelatory dimensions, revelatory dimensions. The composer himself described his work as a divine art. And he regarded his symphonies as not merely products of high craftsmanship, but expressions of a moral vision, his, his words, a deeply rooted belief that great music can move the world. The composer saw his life and work as a mission and a vocation, as many artists have done in centuries and generations gone by. The fact that the modern and now postmodern world, with all its pessimism and scepticism, has nothing convincing to contradict this high assessment of the high-minded inspiration behind Beethoven's greatness points to the unique unassailability of the composer's achievements and his eternal reputation. To be an effective advocate for the importance of music and the arts in society, a composer, I think, must have some engagement with and a comprehension of how politics work. It was certainly the case with Beethoven, and I think it's certainly the case today. For example, just think how a young composer in mainland Europe must have viewed the world in 1945, emerging from World War, Holocaust and fascism. It must have felt as if the old world had failed and deserved to be ditched. For many composers, musical tradition became regarded as flawed, as with all Europe European traditions, it had, so they said, led to the Third Reich and to mass destruction, to the end of culture. And if the old bourgeois traditions and ideas had led to Hitler and to Auschwitz, then those traditions and ideas deserved to be abandoned, so the thinking went. Culture, art, music, all needed to begin again with a blank page, so that this pure virgin territory could be shaped by the new generation and made better. This outlook, I'm sure you're aware, prevailed in philosophy and in politics, as well as the arts. And one can understand how it gained traction, especially among young idealists. We can never forget, ladies and gentlemen, that the Holocaust was committed by people from one of the greatest Western civilizations, one like ours. People who cultivated their fine artistic tastes in music and other forms. The house at Wannsee in Germany was a lovely, serene setting for a conference devoted to the planning of the world's greatest crime. But it was typical for the Nazis to surround themselves with beautiful scenery, classic buildings, classical music and books. Some of the most notorious Nazi concentration camps were built in beautiful locations and had such incongruous features as flower gardens, birdhouses, orchestras, 
I know a woman who played in the orchestra at Auschwitz, a library, a zoo, and a swimming pool. Reinhard Heydrich, who chose Van C for the conference, was an aristocratic and cultured man, an athlete, and a talented musician. His Van Z conference was to meticulously plan the implementation of the final solution and the destruction of six million Jews. Most of the participants at this event were educated men um, and several had law degrees. Many cultured men and women talk today in elevated terms of the spirituality of the arts, I do myself and even of the arts filling the vacuum vacated by religion in the modern world. I don't do that. But there are lessons from recent history which should make us, which should make us very wary and cautious of this. The German philosopher and musicologist Theodor Adorno argued that after Auschwitz, it is barbaric to even attempt to write poetry, that art, can never be a guarantee of empathy or morality or even civilization. The Nazis taught us that with their fine appreciation of classical music. Adorno argued that Auschwitz has demonstrated irrefutably that culture has failed. He said that it could happen in the midst of the philosophical traditions, the arts and the enlightening sciences says more than just that these failed to take hold of and change the people. All culture after Auschwitz, including its urgent critique, is rubbish. This stark analysis asks what culture, what culture could possibly mean after the absolute failure of culture. The academic Elaine Martin writes, the Shoah, the Holocaust, a systematic mechanical annihilation of a specific group selected on the basis of alleged biological traits and perversely organized with bureaucratic efficiency was a mockery of the very idea of culture which had survived into the 20th century. What credibility could cultural and artistic discourse possibly have, having themselves emanated from the very same culture from which Auschwitz had sprung. And George Steiner wrote, we now know that a man can read Goethe or Rilke in the evening, that he can play Bach and Schubert and go to his work and go to his day's work at Auschwitz in the morning. The mass murder of millions was carried out within a framework of a society at the peak of cultural and artistic achievement. No, many, no, no wonder many have judged that such a society has lost its legitimacy of artistic discourse after this culture had gone so catastrophically awry. So ladies and gentlemen, could Adorno or was Adorno right when he argued that Auschwitz was far more than just an unpleasant but nonetheless temporary glitch in an otherwise progressive culture. Auschwitz, he said, was part and parcel of modernity and progress themselves. He said, millions of innocent people to wrangle over the figure is in itself inhumane have been systematically murdered. This was no superficial phenomenon. It is not seen, it's not to be seen as an aberration from the otherwise progressive tendencies of, of progress and enlightenment and supposed steady perfection of humanity. In fact, our still fashionable view that man can be perfected is the very reason our culture has been able to produce the likes of Auschwitz and will continue to do so until humanity embraces a truly radical counter ontology. The fact that centuries of Enlightenment culture failed to predict and prevent the forces of fascism and eugenics is an implacable indictment of that culture. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, that eugenics was very popular among the liberal, civilised bien-pensant 
of the United States, the United Kingdom and Scandinavia before the Nazis got excited about it. And it's back on the agenda today in the modern world's obsession with screening out the disabled. Adorno then wrote, the idea that after this war, life could go on as normal, that culture can be resurrected, as if the resurrection of culture would not itself be its own negation, is idiotic. Millions of Jews have been murdered and this should be an interlude and not the actual catastrophe. What exactly is this culture awaiting? Those of us with eyes to look around us might be alarmed to see that we might not need to await too long for another catastrophic answer to Adorno's question. The moral philosopher Alistair McIntyre has suggested that it may have begun already. He suggests that the apparent failures of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment project to, to provide a rational underpinning to our moral life was not just the failures of its most distinguished intellectuals, but he suggests that its values cannot be disentangled from the iron fist of progressive politics. They were hand in glove from the start and evident in the revolutionary violence and terror of the French Revolution, a terror which attempted to replace God with revolutionary man emptying the churches of the images of Jesus and his mother and replacing them with the gods and goddesses of the future. And it didn't take long for new improved man to unleash the violence inherent in this new creed across Europe. And this was to happen time and time again in the centuries ahead. <clears throat> so this in a sense was the backdrop to culture at the end of World War II and its implications continue today. It affected artists, philosophers, writers, politicians, poets, believers and non-believers and composers. For many in the 1940s and 50s, there was a feeling that culture had to begin again, free from the stains of all that had gone wrong. What was required, so the thinking went, was a virgin territory, the blank page, the year zero. But perhaps a realistic review of history and culture since the French Revolution is what might be needed here. A bracing and useful pessimistic approach to the bogus optimisms which have given us fascism, communism and Nazism in the 20th century might also be useful in our reappraisals of cultural and artistic modernisms too. What would this mean for a composer? Well, I think the composer, like everyone else, must take a broad sweeping view of history, embracing the idealistic moral symphonic vision and aspirations of Beethoven through to the apparent failures of culture in the 20th century, where even artists and the arts themselves couldn't be trusted to do the right thing. So to come back to the questions I was asked in Russia last year, is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? And does the work of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? <clears throat> well, the moral dimension is one thing which can transcend era, custom, culture and religion. But civic values are another thing altogether. What happens if, if the civic values go wrong? What if the civic majority are mistaken and become seduced by evil? What happens if a society loses sight of what is right and wrong? It takes more than moral courage for a person, an artist or not, to negotiate the opprobrium and poss possible persecution that attends standing up for goodness and its attendant truth and beauty. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a favorite rhetorical trick these days, especially amongst the young, to ask, what would Jesus do? 
What would Jesus say? Meaning, what would be Christ's reaction if he was here now and facing the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries? Well, I'm not going to ask such a dramatic question. I'm simply going to ask, what would Beethoven do? In the midst of the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries, what would Beethoven have done? Well, he stood on the side of the poor and oppressed when he, he took a preferential option for them in his prisoner's chorus in his one opera, Fidelium. He gave expression to the embrace of human solidarity in the presence of a loving God in his Schiller setting in the Ninth Symphony. But politics confused even him. One moment he was dedicating music to Napoleon, the next he was celebrating his defeat at the hands of the British Army and Wellington at Waterloo. But he was certainly a, bar a barometer of his age, but responded in strange and unexpected ways. There is a moment, a very brief moment in Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, where the Lamb of God overcomes the terrors of contemporary war and revolution. Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, misereri nobis, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. As you know, in many musical settings of this mass movement, a composer will attempt to invoke solace and peace. But in Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, the world breaks in at this point. The ontology of violence, which seeks to overthrow the kingdom of heaven, the ideology of an ever improving human society, whether we want it or not, invades this sacred text almost as if it's attempting to sweep the loving God aside, attempting to take control imperially and to become the new spirit of the age. It's an extraordinary musical moment because in this tread of military drums and trumpets, the usurper is clearly the revolutionary clamor that Beethoven saw all around him at the time a revolutionary clamor that sought to bring the merciful Lamb of God to its knees and lead it to the slaughterhouse. And in this music, the voices respond anxiously, fearfully, dona nobis pacem. But there is defiance in this fearfulness. The counter ontology is announced and expressed in Beethoven's transformation of the sounds of violence into the glorious mercy of God. And I want to end this lecture with uh, an exploration of this point on mercy, on divine mercy. Because this moment, this brief moment in the Misa Solemnis is a signal from musical history that every time the Lamb of God is led to the next slaughterhouse, whether it be in pogrom, gulag, concentration camp, or the constant redefining of human worth and nature, there is an answer and a way of fighting back, a way of remembering who we are and that we are indeed loved in spite of everything by a merciful God. Be Beethoven was an extraordinary seismograph of polit political ethics and religion. He was inspired by resistance to despots as well as moral ideals in human behavior. He wrote a Sigur symphony, a victory symphony for the 16th century hero Egmont and Wellington's victory, not to mention his one opera, Fidelio, which celebrates married love, freedom from slavery and the defeat of tyrants to the Catholic all interconnected. Tyrants can only be defeated by brave resistance and tyrants must never be flattered. So, when the scales fell from his eyes, he changed his mind over the dedication of his Eroica symphony and he erased the name of Napoleon from the score when he declared himself emperor. Many talk of Beethoven's search for justice in these works, but it's, it is tempered with a profound knowledge of divine mercy. 
expressed with insight and vision, insight and vision in his Misa Solemnis and in his opera Fidelio. Would he have fallen silent if he had witnessed the Holocaust, according to Adorno's ad advice? Or might he have embraced its horror in a new mass setting? Because he brought a glimpse of mercy in the heart of the abyss into mass and opera. Perhaps that's how composers, poets and the rest could answer Adorno now too. Because ladies and gentlemen, there is something in mercy that is rather humbling to all sides. Which is why secularists de despise it as a pity that shames human nature. To say that we all need it undermines modernity's shibboleth of autonomy. The claim that I can give myself the law or meaning because my nature is perfectly intact and needs no redemptive underpinning from the sky fairy and his grace. But real peace and understanding based on an ontology of divine love requires a recognition that we are all needy sons and daughters of Adam, needy of mercy, which is our redemptive truth. And in the end, I suggest our liberation. Thank you. Thank you so much. A wonderful talk. I find that so fascinating that you relate that, um, you relate that idea that that obviously in the in the 40s and 50s there's this feeling among the arts that we couldn't um we couldn't progress along the same path like the this path that led us to obviously the um the holocaust and all of these horrors that the the modern view was okay well we have to break away we have to start fresh we have to totally um have a, a blank slate and yet I forget who, who you said it might have been um, Adorno. It, he kind of pointed out that that view, that there was something we could do in our culture that could save us, is in fact part of the root of the whole problem, right? That, that human beings feel that in some way they can save themselves, that, their, that culture itself can be, um, can be sanctifying, and yet, um, it's in fact that view that, that we can sanctify ourselves that is at the root of the ability of human beings to go home and, li and read Rilke and then go to work and do what they did. I, I just, I'd never thought about that before, but I thought that was a really powerful point you made. Um, Archbishop, I wanted to ask you, since um, I know you have done so much in our archdiocese to promote um, the arts to promote music through the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute and so many other things. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts um, on on promoting arts within the archdiocese and kind of what what you you view the arts as as a uh, as a tool or as an important part of of, of ministry in, in the world today. Oh, well, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Sir James. What a very, very rich uh, talk you gave us. So much food for thought there, so much to chew on. This is very deep. And uh, yes, the idea of, uh, you brought us back very well to that place after the Second World War and where, where the world was at. This idea that we could start from scratch and rebuild, rebuild culture from, uh, from the ground up uh, as if it could be done sort of in a vacuum starting uh, on its own. That's it, just not possible. Culture has to build on itself. And it was a deconstruction that had been happening. And uh, we need a reconstruction uh, starting over in that sense, building on what, what, is, what is good and noble in the culture. This project of, of rebuilding and redefining seems to be an unending cycle. We're constantly redefining ourselves, redefining our society, the institutions of our society, um, because we don't begin at the right place uh, with putting God at the center. 
I see the arts getting back to your question, Joseph, as, as helping us to do that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll defer to the genius in, in the group here, but I think art is both an end in itself and, and a means to an end. When it's applied to the sacred, to worship, then it becomes a mean to an end, a means to an end, um, which could be, it's, it's such a noble end in and of itself, uh, only an end such as the worship of the one true God could it defer to and become a means toward. Uh, beauty does so much to uh, ennoble the soul and instill a, a desire for a desire for beauty. Beauty, uh, not just aesthetical, but uh, in terms of character, in terms of virtue. And it gives that sense of, of inspiration. So I, I see the need to, to create a, a culture of beauty um, in our world, but you know, beginning in our worship uh, with everything <laughs> with Sir James has been in, uh, narrated about that's happened in our society, so much ugliness has entered in. Um, we need to begin uh, with, with beauty. Beauty is something that's universal too, right? It's immediately recognizable. It's not something you can argue with. Uh, people say you have your truth, I have my truth, but they don't say you have your beauty, I have my beauty. They do say beauty is an eye of the beholder, but that has its limits because people can re universally recognize what is ugly and, and what is beautiful. So I think it helps to uh, lift the soul and, and instill a certain desire for living a life that is beautiful, a life that is virtuous and, and gives us a sense of our life is not about constantly reinventing ourselves. It's not the, that myth of the, the autonomous self, but it's to give glory to God. So drawing us out of ourselves, which is what love is, draws us out of ourselves. And we're willing to sacrifice for the good of another in order to give uh, honor and worship to God. That's wonderful. I think that goes back kind of to what Sir James was talking about with uh, Fidelio, for example, he was relating some, some themes in Fidelio, Beethoven's opera, a secular work, opera being historically a decidedly secular art form, um, to also the text and the, the uh, musical tools used in Missa Solemnis, a, a religious work, and that he's really using his music for one and the same purpose. And, and I was going to throw that back to Sir James and ask, it seems that in a way, the answer to your question, like what is the moral dimension of composing or, or does composing have a moral dimension? It seems like part of that answer is that in a way, um, for, for the composer who composes both religious and, um, and secular music, in, in a way, it seems that it, at least if you take Beethoven as an example, it, in a way he might not have seen there to be a divide there because music is addressing our humanity. And that, that you know, we as human beings um, need mercy. We as human beings need relationship with Christ in a way that that you know our our artificial um, delineations between secular and religious might not, in, in effect, be that important if if what's being expressed is at the end of the day um, a spiritual dimension. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Well, it, I think it's absolutely uh, fascinating to when you draw um, attention to the fact that Beethoven was interested in both the sacred and the secular almost simultaneously. He wrote beautiful secular music, um, Fidelio being a case in point, which is a love story. Um, as I say, it's, 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 there's a married couple at the heart of it, which. Uh, uh, sends some strange signals to our modern world that they kind of they, they hear this wonderful piece of music but they they can sometimes wonder why on earth Beethoven is so obsessed with with marriage considering he's a man that never married um, but he had a, a great he quite clearly saw something in in marriage something of, of the sacrament of marriage that and he, he referred to this in his life as something that uh, was vital and had an impact on the society around about the couple, around about the family and impacted on the families. And that he made the connection between marriage and the defeat of tyranny um, and, and the love of the poor, love of the, the repressed, love of the, uh, the desperate um, 
uh, and that they were all interconnected in some way. Again, uh, the modern world scratches its head at, at these connections. But I think Beethoven is clearly a, question, a, a composer from the past who allowed the secular and the sacred to commingle and that you can um, hear in secular music like the, like, like the opera, but also in his symphonies, uh, a kind of search for the sacred as well. And when, when many people in the musical world, people who don't necessarily share our faith, talk about music as being a great spiritual art form, the most spiritual of the arts, they're kind of acknowledging a truth about music. There is something about music which allows us to see beyond ourselves, or at least see beyond ourselves as simply the sum of our parts to something uh, numinous. Um, there is something about the nature of music uh, which opens a window on the divine, and this can be done in purely secular forms as well as uh, the great sacred forms for liturgy and so on. Uh, and I've always found that when I speak to my fellow music lovers, most of whom don't sh share my worldview on anything much, uh, we have this meeting ground um, where we understand that music is this special spiritual art form. And even the agnostic and the atheist and the skeptic amongst those music lovers will use the word spiritual uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, they may not quite define it in some in ways similar to our definitions, but they will use it a lot because it points to something about the nature of music, which is transformative. They see that this love of music, this life of music, this engagement with music has, give, has turned their, their world around, that has given their life meaning and, and, and great beauty. And I always find that the musical world is a, is a meeting of quite disparate minds. I find that um, the, the, my fellow music lovers, even though they don't, don't share my religion, um, are cognizant of where that musical culture has come from and that deep at the heart of this musical culture is something to do with our Judeo-Christian civilization. And they are respectful of that. And that's why I think that there's a great open-mindedness and open-heartedness amongst people who love music. And the great culture wars, which cause so much division and friction and toxicity in so much else of our culture, seems to be uh, Touchwood quite absent from the world of music. We seem to understand there's something about this music which uh, allows us to see beyond those cultural divisions, perhaps some might say into the very nature of God himself. Beautiful, thank you. And um, I find it interesting that some of the, some of the composers you mentioned earlier, who like Arvo Pert and Henry Goretzky, um, these are people who the, their music is in many ways explicitly spiritual, if not actually religious in nature. And yet there's some of the, I would say few, you would call classical composers who have achieved like mainstream recognition. There's something about their music that, that is so appealing at a gut level, even to people who aren't necessarily believers that it obviously, it, it um, you know, music as, as an art form that, moves the spirit it, it moves the spirit in an unmediated way um that it's something about that those composers who have a deep spiritual commitment seems to actually achieve a lot of mainstream appreciation i, I would agree uh, and it's it's interesting uh, when you point out to uh especially skeptics um whether they're music lovers or not that the um in in our age of modernity the 20th century the 21st century, the age of unbelief, as it were, um, many of the great composers through this time were profoundly religious men and women. It's almost as if um, that umbilical link between music and the sacred can't be erased. So if you look at the likes of Stravinsky, for example, who came to, over to live in California uh, from, from Russia, he was a man of faith. He, he got very interested in uh, the Western church, though he was, he was always faithful to his orthodox roots. He set the mass, he set the psalms, he wrote little prayers uh, like the Pater Noster and Ave Maria. He was a man of faith. Uh, the other great polar opposite uh, at that time uh, in, in modernity um, was Schoenberg, again, who 
has, has Californian connections. Um, and he reconverted to a practicing Judaism after he left Germany. And his later music is infused with a Jewish spirit, um, a Jewish character, a Jewish theology, in fact. Um, and right through the, the 20th century, of course, there was Olivier Messiaen, the great French composer, who wrote uh, masterworks uh, inspired by his Catholic faith and which, in a sense, taught the world uh, about, about his Catholic faith. And he's, he's seen as one of the great figures, the great pinnacles of modernism, who was a teacher of Boulez and Stockhausen. And yet his, his Catholicism uh, was not a barrier um, to a, a wider understanding of his greatness. In fact, the, the wonderful thing about Olivier Messiaen, and if, if, if our audience don't know his music very much, I, I suggest that you go and find a piece called The Quartet for the End of Time. He wrote this uh, as a prisoner of war of the Germans. He was captured in France. He was, he was a French, French army officer in, in early 1940. And he was uh, put in uh, uh, a prisoner of war camp in Poland, Stalag 8 in Gurlitz. And he wrote the, the, the Quartet for the End of Time, which is a great um, exploration of the infinity of God, the infinity of heaven. He wrote this uh, as a prisoner. Uh, in very bad conditions. His first audience were hundreds of his fellow prisoners uh, from all over Europe and their Nazi prison guards who uh, heard this piece of, this strange piece of music uh, as a unified audience. And it's such a, 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 sig a signal that music can indeed uh, bind us together and in a very real and dramatic sense um, conquer uh, the, the horrendous cultural and uh, um, social and political divisions that have, that have uh, afflicted us in modernity. And then I, I mentioned some of the composers um, that came after Shostakovich from behind the Iron Curtain. And I noticed one of the questions was asking about who these composers are, the ones that came after Pert and Goretzky. Well, in Russia, uh, there were people like... Uh, Alfred Schnitke and Sofia Gubay Dolina, who um, were profoundly, Gubay Dolina is still alive, were profoundly religious, a man and woman. Um, Gubay Dolina refers to uh, the, the, the role of, the, of sacrament in her music, that her music is Eucharistic. And this, this is, these are composers who came from a society where religion was deliberately repressed. Um, and yet in that society, um, God's flame uh, kept flickering in, in, the, in the life and work of uh, the country's great composers. So the, 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 the spirit is alive and will never die in music. I think there is something about music, which um, many music lovers point to as deeply spiritual and deeply part of the search for the sacred. I, um, uh, when you were mentioning uh, Olivia Messiaen, one of my favorite composers, um, I read, uh, I believe it was The Rest is Noise, this book by Alex Ross, kind of an overview of many tw early 20th century composers. There's a, I believe it's that book, there's a story about him teaching Boulez, his student, who's another a famous composer, um, very, um, very complex music that, but, I mean, both of them wrote, but there's a story that Boulez asked him, like, why? why is this piece so tonal? Like, he's like, why is it so beautiful? He's like, because Boulez is more about like this very, um, very rigid, very uh, kind of austere kind of music. And, and he was asking his teacher, Messiaen, who was also this great technical mind. He's like, why is this piece so pretty? <laughs> and Messiaen said something to the effect of, well, basically you can't forget about divine mercy. He's like, you have to have a mercy in your piece. It can't all be technique. It can't all be, you have to have, you know, mercy on your audience in the same way God has mercy on us. <laughs> you know, or something to that effect. And Boulez didn't like that at all because he wasn't a, a believer. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so that, that reminded me of that. But I also wanted you to, um, I wanted to ask you as a composer um, that, I, as someone who's involved in, in classical music, who plays a lot of, um, of obviously music that's monumental, Beethoven, Haydn, um, all of these uh, great composers from the past, but also more modern composers. I wanted to ask you about 
kind of the role of um, innovation, like how how you innovations, how important is it for composers, um, especially religious minded composers to adopt new, um, like push the boundaries in terms of what they're writing? Does it have, can a composer like stay within what's been done before or should the composer push the boundaries? And how, how do you think about that for yourself? Yes, I, I see a, a similar question coming up in the, the chat box about that, about innovation. Um, it, it's an interesting one. It's one that composers have obsessed about. It's a question that composers have obs obsessed about these last 50 or 60 years. And it was part of that um, desire to begin again, as it were, um, that I talked about after the Second World War. And perhaps that impacted on a whole group of uh, young modernists in the 50s and 60s who, who, who felt that they had to innovate, that every piece had to, in a sense, reinvent the wheel. And, um, and, and it, composers who didn't do that were marked down uh, as aesthetically uninteresting or aesthetically um, conservative. And that, that was about the worst thing you could, you could be uh, for a long while. I think, though, that with the passage of time, um, there's been a relaxation of these rigidities in, in music and possibly some of the other arts too, where people don't obsess or fetishize so much about the new all the time, having to create something that's never been done before. And that uh, in the, the vacuum that that, let's say, postmodern world has created, we've begun to reevaluate the role of tradition. I. It took me a while to say to myself and to others that that tradition is important to me. Musical tradition, religious tradition, uh, various, many, various traditions are important. You, you don't need to be a, a reactionary to, uh, if, to value the role of tradition. Um, and I, I like to use the analogy um, in music, but also in, in the matters of religion and other things of a, a river. Uh, a river running through a landscape. And um, that river, you can imagine, is a river that runs through history. And that river has, river has a source away over there somewhere. Uh, and, and it runs past you at any given point in history, away into the future. There is nothing reactionary about that river. It's a living thing with a deep past, um, a living present, and very much a, a, a vibrant future. If you put a dam into that river, it causes desiccation and it causes uh, the loss of life. It, it dries the river up um, and, and you, you desiccate the place. It becomes a desert. Um, it's far better to stand at the bank of that river and see and feel where it has come from and feel part of it, to be enriched by the presence of that river. Uh, the world is... Um, um, fed by the flowing of that river uh, through history. And in that sense, that is, a, that is just as radical and forward-looking and uh, optimistic of you, uh, of tradition uh, as, as anything that, that can, comes from the more radical Marxist or, or, or modernist take on culture and history. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's really nice to, to hear you say that as, as someone who is deeply involved in both like new new music and old music obviously to, to me as a as someone who loves both deeply i i think that it's very encouraging to hear that just the importance of of fostering the deep path that, that we come from and also forging ahead into the the future we're gonna um look at some of the audience questions here we got some awesome questions here in the chat um so first from uh, Clifford Woods, um, let's see, he said, what about the 18th and 19th period of a uh, 19th century period of enslaved pe people? How did that affect the arts? Yes, I saw that. That's a very interesting question. And I think that many of us involved in our society and our culture are playing a bit of a catch up game. We're in the remedial class with a whole strain of things from our recent history. Um, if, we've, if we take a, a moral stance um, with the Third Reich, uh, we've got to look back. Now that we have knowledge and understanding uh, of what uh, 
um, our society uh, was like in the 18th and 19th century and try to reappraise that, uh, to find a way of making sense of, uh, of the great um, 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 uh, great issues and problems uh, that uh, our incomplete view of human morality has brought to many, the, the great tragedies that slavery, for example, has brought to uh, many people, millions of people throughout the 18th and 19th century, and still brings to many people today. Slav slavery hasn't gone away. I'm, I'm encouraged by many in the arts who are f discovering uh, composers from um, 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 black and ethnic minority communities, both in your country and over here, and giving them a platform again, uh, sometimes for the first time. Um, I've always been a great supporter of women composers. There, there are more women composers now than ever. There were reasons why uh, they were um, more reluctant to come forward or, or unable to come forward in centuries past. We've got the chance to, uh, to sort that out. And I've always valued the role of women in music. And I think we can spread that uh, to many other aspects of a society, uh, re-engage, um, uh, re-evaluate what what has happened in our world in the last 200 years and maybe make amends for it a new in a new a new culture a renewed culture uh, as we go forward perhaps that's part of the river too that's wonderful um uh related to that um who are the composers so this is from jonathan cursor who are the composers today who have followed parrot goretzky taverner um, and even vocal groups like anon for hilliard and talis other than your works, I don't see much new, at least on gramophone or BBC music. So do you have any other uh, recommendation? Well, um, good, good question. There are many young composers. It's, it's not, it probably wouldn't be best to, uh, to advisable to mention them. I keep coming across them in, in my own country, but also in many other countries uh, who have been inspired by the composers that uh, Jonathan mentions, Arvo Pert, Goretzky, Taverner, of course, I had some fantastic conversations with John Taverner. I don't know if his music is known so much in the, in the United States, but John Taverner was a, a convert to orthodoxy and uh, wrote a lot of music inspired by both Greek and Russian Orthodox liturgy and theology. Um, and uh, I, th I think th there are many who have been inspired by that. Um, Again, behind the Iron Curtain, there have been composers like um, Cancelli, Ghia Cancelli, uh, who has recently died. Uh, Jonathan might want to explore his music. Really beautiful music shaped by Georgian liturgical music, Georgian folk music, very austere, um, an austere beauty that you can sometimes find uh, in the music from that part of the world. He was Georgian. Um, Valery Silvestrov from the Ukraine is still alive. His fifth symphony is astonishingly beautiful in a kind of elusive and simple way. Um, so there's two for a start. Jonathan uh, Cancelli and Silvestrov uh, would, uh, you, you would find a, a very interesting exploration in those two composers' work. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just putting those in the chat so we don't lose it. Okay, it was Gia Cancelli and Valentin Silvestrov? Silvestrov, yes, Silvestrov from the Ukraine. He lives yes. in Kiev. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good. And then let's see, moving on. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, we have someone asking, Sir James, I'm a member. This is Susan. Uh, Sir James, I'm a member of a choral group and we regularly perform works by modern composers. I'm wondering if you're familiar with the works of Dan Forrest? Yeah, I'm not familiar with his music yet, but his name keeps coming up a lot in the interesting conversations I have with especially American musicians and he's on my to-do list. Uh, I'm going straight from here to discover uh, more about the music of Dan Forrest. Awesome. Um, shout out, uh, shout out to Frank LaRocca <laughs> there in the chat also. That's wonderful. Yes, he's yeah. done some wonderful things for the uh, Benedict 16 Institute. Um, and was also there at our, uh, at the live stream last or two weeks ago. Uh, 
I also notice, um, Joseph, in the Q&A box uh, that Frank has a question, um, which, which intrigued me actually. Was, um, I, I gave him an account of John Cage's 433, uh, which is a very strange concept, if, if, uh, rather than a piece of music. Uh, if you don't know this piece, piece, it's actually four minutes, 33 seconds of silence. Um, it's a kind of provocation to the music culture. John Cage, of course, is one of the great kind of American avant-gardists um, uh, who um, wrote a lot of very strange music and had a lot of very strange ideas about music and the arts through the 1950s and 60s. But there's a, there's a story in some, some magazine which said he got his idea for this piece by um, uh, attending, you know, wandering into a New York church, a Catholic church, just at the moment of uh, consecration. And then, of course, in the, in the um, extraordinary form mass, which it would have been in the 1950s, um, it usually lasts about four minutes, sometimes four and a half minutes of silence. And so the, the, the uh, suggestion is that uh, this great avant-garde concept work um, at the heart of much of the thinking of uh, many composers over the last few decades finds its root deeply, perhaps by accident, in Catholic culture. Uh, in fact, in, in the, the celebration of the Mass itself, which is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, silence is important for composers. It wasn't just John Cage. Composers live with silence. They need that silence. It's a necessary silence. Uh, it, it's a, a silence that you have to lose yourself in in order to encounter the music paradoxically. It's in the silence of our hearts and minds and our souls that we encounter the very germinology, the DNA, the little threads of ideas that eventually percolate and grow and evolve into a piece of music. Uh, silence is indeed a kind of womb uh, in which uh, the one's music can grow. That's wonderful. John, John, Cage, John Cage was onto something. Yeah, I hadn't, I've never heard that before. That's really fascinating that he might have gotten that from, from the extraordinary form. That's amazing. Um, I, we have one more question um, from Estrella Murillo. The ministry, No One Dies Alone, called No One Dies Alone Music, has a meaningful impact to the hospice patient and their loved ones. It brings calmness and peace. Do you have any recommendation of which soft, soothing music to use? Oh. Oh, uh, um, Estrella is absolutely right. Um, it's a great comfort to um, the elderly, uh, especially the dying people at the end of their life, to encounter music. It brings back great memories. Um, it it um, brings them solace. Um, they remember their loved ones. They remember a life of love through music. And... Um, whether the music needs to be soothing or soft is another matter. Uh, I can understand why you would want some soft and soothing music, but sometimes um, more animated music can work well. But as long as the music can relate perhaps to something in the, um, the dying person's memory, I think that's important. If you can tease out from the patient um, what was important to them in music in their past that makes them uh, remember good things um, and, and, can, and they can go to, their, their, to meet their maker uh, with those um, beautiful thoughts and memories in their mind. That's wonderful. Um, so we, um, we're about here at, at uh, time here. Um, I just wanted to ask maybe that as a way of, uh, of wrapping it up, we have a couple more questions in here and I just thought it would be nice to ask you to wrap things up um, as a composer. Um, Maybe what, what are some things that inspire you? Like when, when you're sitting down to write something, what, what inspires you? What, what gets that creativity kind of going? Well, it, it's, it's different things for different pieces, different, different things for every piece I write. If, you, if one is setting text, the, the text has, has to be the, the prime importance, um, whether that text is sacred or secular. However, music is an abstract form. Uh, it's the most abstract of the arts, as well as being the most spiritual of the arts. And therefore, we com composers, we musicians, deal with abstract concepts and abstract sounds. It's how we organise sound into something coherent, indeed something beautiful, perhaps, 
that can be the real inspiration and perhaps even the real obsession for many composers. We, we have sounds in our head and these sounds uh, communicate meaning and feeling in a, way that music, that in a way that words and image can't. And that's the mystery and I suppose the beauty of music itself. That's wonderful. Um, uh, Archbishop, would you be so kind as to give us your blessing? Yes, and uh, thank you, Joseph, for moderating this. Uh, thanks to all of our participants and those who submitted questions. And once again, very profound thanks to you, Sir James. This has been just a, an awesome experience uh, uh, to, to soak in your wisdom. And I, you've, like I said, you've given us a lot to chew on. So uh, thank you for being so generous with your time and your genius with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for this time we have spent together. May we be enriched by this time to uh, live lives that give you glory and bring your beauty into the world. I pray that Almighty God might send his blessing upon you all, and may it remain with you forever. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop, and thank you so much, Sir James, for sharing your wisdom with us. It was a wonderful talk. Thank and you. It's been great to be with you. It was great to meet you all, um, even in this rather strange scenario. And I look forward to meeting you in person someday in the future. I, ha I have plans to come to San Francisco. Wonderful. Fantastic. Sounds great. <laughs>